book by book. Here we are. I'm Richard Buse, sitting in All Souls Church in Langham Place in London, England, as we come now to the third study in our series of studies on John's Gospel. We've so far looked at Jesus as he's been revealing the Father, secondly, as he's been teaching, and now thirdly, as we come to chapters 4 and 5 of John's Gospel, as he's at work. He is working. I'm joined here by Paul Black and my beloved colleague here in London, and also by our honoured guest, Anne Graham Lotz, whose home is in Raleigh in North Carolina, but here in England for a few precious days which you can spend with us here. Well, what we'll do, I think, first of all, is then to read a little bit. We can't read it all, but chapters 4 and 5 of John's Gospel, why don't I pick up from the woman at the well um, when he meets with her, the Samaritan woman, and I'm looking at chapter 4, verse 10. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. Ah, oh, friends, this is a momentous couple of chapters. Now, I think I'd better start with Paul. Here we are seeing Jesus at work. What has been the teaching of Jesus so far in the Gospel of John, Paul Blackham? And how are we to see this teaching put into practice now, this passage? Well, what we've done is we've seen him at the temple and at the, the wedding, and in both cases he's showing through these miraculous actions and in his explanation of them, he's saying that I'm here to bring new life. I'm the Lord of creation and new creation. And he's making that clear. His agenda is to come and be the reality that everything in the Old Testament was prophesying. He's come not to give symbolic new life, but actual new life. And then he's just had this conversation with Nicodemus saying to him, you must be born again. You must receive the new life from the Spirit that I can give to you. And then, in these two chapters, he's going to actually... Implement. We're going to see what it looks like, actually. Not just in words, but in this woman's life and in the, the man at the pool. He's, in a sense, he's going to put now more into practice, in a visual way, what he's been telling Nicodemus about or his symbolic action at the temple. So I think that's what's happening. So we've seen the agenda now. Now we're coming into the action part of it, which is very interesting. So here with this Samaritan woman, Anne Graham Lotz, um, we read about her here. Um, this living water that they're talking about, and uh, how does this change her? We know Jesus really identifies the, um, what the living water is, and the living water is himself. Mm. And he was offering this Samaritan woman who you know, in the scheme of things, would be at the bottom of the heap because um, the Samaritans were despised for lots of reasons. And she was a woman, and not only was she a woman, but she was a woman who had a checkered past or very, you know, questionable past. And yet he was telling this woman that basically what Paul was saying, that she could be born again, she could receive the living water, she could have joy and peace and live life abundantly if she would place her faith in him and come to him for the living water. And I think it's a beautiful picture of Jesus, who is all we've described him to be, all actually that John has described him to be in this gospel. And we see him sitting beside the well, waiting for this one woman to come. And then his interaction with her, uh, he had obviously singled her out. He was there on purpose to meet with her, to offer himself to her in a fresh way. And when she, he finally reasons with her, she, she begins by saying, I know you're a man. Then she calls him sir. Then she says, now I see you're a prophet. You see her progression of understanding until in the end she doesn't understand all the nuances of the theology and the doctrine and the Samaritans and the Jews. But finally she just sort of blurts out, I know when the Messiah comes who is called Christ. I know he'll answer my questions. I'll know he'll meet the need of my heart. He's the one I'm looking for. Actually, she was just sort of saying in my terms, just give me Jesus. Mm. And then he turns and he tells her in the very next verse, in verse 26, he says, I who speak to you am he. Mm. And he revealed himself to her in a way he didn't to Nicodemus, but he did. And it doesn't tell us exactly at that moment 
what she did, whether she embraced him, whether she fell on her face, but we know she dropped her water bucket, which was... Lifted, um, yeah. Yes, everything that was her priority, all of her responsibilities, what she had put, been focused on, and she ran and told her whole town about Jesus and drew them out so that they could meet him for themselves. And the town of Samaria uh, spent two days with him. And actually, an interesting thing is after Pentecost, Philip went there to preach, do you remember? And there was a tremendous... Uh, outbreak of revival. A wonderful uh, awakening. Yes. And yeah. you know, it was seeds planted from this one woman that yeah. had met Jesus and the time that Jesus spent there for two days. But that's really worthwhile thinking about. Yes. And I mean, you never know what kind of, uh, like your book, your program, in mm -hmm. fact, you put on in, oh, so many towns and cities around the world, just give me Jesus. And coming out of that, you never know, somebody will be awakened, helped. Mm -hmm and be satisfied by Christ and then goes and tells others. That's right. And they're filled with the living water until they overflow. Mm. Mm. I love it. And we're going to learn a great deal more about Christ as we look on at these chapters. I mean, what does he teach us then here, Paul, about worshipping God? Well, he gets into this conversation with the woman and she's quite feisty and um, throws questions at him. And, draw, and as always, he answers these things brilliantly. And there's this time when she's raising this question, is, are the Samaritans right or are the Jews right? And instead of just getting completely embroiled in that, he actually does answer the question, says, oh, the Jews are right. Uh, but, he, but he actually moves quickly on to get to the real issue in this. And he says, well, look, the issue isn't really about geography. Um, it's actually about spiritual reality. And it's quite good to remember that he's saying, look, you must worship God in spirit and in truth. And if we remember the conversation with Nicodemus, this is what's helpful. Jesus is not just making a completely abstract and strange statement. It's just, again, the same point. You can't worship God in the flesh mm -hmm. just from human religion or human agenda or getting tied up in religion because she's got stuck in religion with her question. He said, no, it's about spirit. It's about new life. It's about this new birth. You must, have, you must begin again, begin approach God in this totally different way, in the way that only he can give through, the, through living water. He was really offering her a personal relationship. Mm. You know, it was not just spiritual reality. I mean, it was, but the spiritual reality mm. is that we can have a personal relationship with God through Jesus. So when he offered her the living water, you know, that's to drink, that's to... Um, bring it into yourself. And that was what he was offering to her. And he was telling Nicodemus how that would come about through being born again. Mm -hmm. But he was telling this woman in such a beautiful, gentle way that uh, she could not only start over again, but she, she, a Samaritan woman, could have a personal relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Isn't that wonderful? It's, it's better than just propping something up. I mean, we yeah. hear the sound of the, of the, of the they're doing up the BBC next mm -hmm. door you know, giving it a facelift and we can hear all the scaffolding we put into shape. It's much more than just putting a bit yeah. of scaffolding in. <laughs> right. It's actually starting right, yeah. right from the very yeah. inside. Yeah. That is wonderful. So after this encounter with Jesus then, we read that the royal official and his whole family are changed. Why is that, Anne? You know, there's the most wonderful phrase in verse 50. This, the centurion came to Jesus and told him that his son was ill and asked Jesus to come home with him and heal him. Mm -hmm. And Jesus, in essence, said, I don't need to come home with you. I can heal him long distance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I just say the word and he'll be healed. And in verse 50, Jesus said, you may go, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. So right there, the man believed the word of God as mm -hmm. Jesus imparted it to him. And he went home and found out that his son had been healed at that very hour. And the hour was not just when Jesus said it, but when he believed it. And because this man, who was the father and the head of his household, he placed his faith in God's Word, his whole family came to faith. Mm -hmm. And I think the lesson for us is really um, very deep and very basic in the Christian home. I think fathers and mothers, but fathers in particular, have a tremendous influence on their families. And we watch our fathers. We want our father's blessing. You know, we emulate our fathers. And this father placed his faith in God's word. As a result, his son's problems were solved and the whole family came to faith. And it's a challenge, I think, to fathers to examine what they believe about God's word, to per put their personal faith in God's word, let it impact their lives. And the fallout is that it impacts our families. Oh, yes. In fact, my own grandfather, became a follower of Jesus Christ through listening to the preaching of D.L. Moody well over a hundred years ago. Yes. That started the whole Bible yes. line in yes. our family. Yes. 
just through because of one person yeah. is wonderful. And he became a father and then my grandfather. That's right. And, you know, people are always asking me uh, what my father did to influence me or, you know, and I don't know if they think for family devotions he preached at us, or, <laughs> but it was watching his example, you know, and seeing his love for the Lord and his love for people who are lost and his heart for the gospel and just the example of who my father mm -hmm. is and the personal faith he has in, in the gospel mm -hmm. that would impact me or my siblings. And this father has some, had someone, he, he put his faith in God's word as Jesus revealed it to him. And as a result, his family's life was changed. You know, what an incredible challenge to parents. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, we ought to move on to chapter 5 mm -hmm. before our time runs out. Look, let's look at chapter 5 for a minute. Uh, Paul Blackham, in verse 9, this mm -hmm. healing of the man by the pool of Bethesda. By the way, I've been there. I don't know whether either of you have been there, but I've been there. Mm -hmm. I've seen, you can see the water still there. Five colonnades, you know, and uh, it's all been, it was dug up some years ago. They've suddenly found the pool of Bethesda when a lot of people have said, oh, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. We knew it was there all the time, of course. Okay. Well, pool of Bethesda, verse 9. John tells us that the healing of the man by the pool of Bethesda happened on the Sabbath day. Is that a big deal, Paul? I mean, how does knowing this help us to understand the whole event? Well, this is such a big thing that because Jesus does it on the Sabbath, the Jerusalem people really don't like him. And even when he returns to Jerusalem in later chapters, they're still upset about this incident. Because when he works on the Sabbath, he works on the Sabbath as far as they're concerned. And uh, when they challenge him about that, and this is the extraordinary thing, that all this thing about Sabbath, and God's rest, it was all supposed to be looking forward to this new life, direct relationship, this enjoying the company of God. That was what Sabbath was for, to make people long for that. When he comes, the living God, and gives Sabbath rest, they're like, oh, you can't give Sabbath rest on the Sabbath. <laughs> it's, like, That's off. <laughs> it's, just the it's so ridiculous. And then they say, well, you can't work anyway because um, God doesn't work on the Sabbath. And he says, oh, God does work. The work of God is redemption, is bringing rest, is healing, is saving. And, that's what, and therefore, that's my job. Because just as my father works, so do I on the real work which is redemption. And that's the amazing thing, that in a sense he changes the whole theology of work. He says, what is real work? Real work's this redemption. They're getting upset about trivial activities, and he's saying, no, real work. And it is the work that God does, the Father and the Son, the work of redemption. It's, it's tremendous. Well, he was really throwing down the gauntlet, wasn't yeah. he? Because he could have healed that man any other day of the week. That man yeah. had been there for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> but he did it on the Sabbath Just so that he was forcing time. them yeah. to confront the issue of who he is. Yeah. You know? And one of my special verses I've often taken, when, I, when I'm needing reassurance as a Christian worker, I've often taken hold of verse 17. Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work mm -hmm. to this very day, and I too mm -hmm. am working. So I think Jesus is still at work. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just a wonderful reassurance that we can then participate and take new heart from that. Well, and may I ask you a question as we just uh, continue? What do we learn here in the rest of chapter 5 about the relationships, the relationship between God the Father and God the Son? Or if, put it like this, how, how is Jesus the test of all religion or religious ideas or true faith? When it goes back, I think, to what we were just sort of talking about and that Jesus um, was asserting that he was more than just a man, more than just a prophet, to come and heal on the Sabbath and confront them in some of these ba basic issues and really declaring himself to be God. And so he says in verse, what well, says in verse 18 that they tried all the harder to kill him because he was even calling his God his own father, making himself equal with God. And he goes on and says, if you don't honor him, you don't honor God. That if you want to honor God, you must honor him because he and his father are one. And the dramatic truth that Jesus is just laying right out there is that there is a God at the center of the universe, creator of everything, and he has revealed himself through Jesus Christ. And if you do not believe in Jesus, if you just say there are other gods and Jesus is sort of a good prophet or a nice man or whatever, but you don't honor him as God in the flesh, then you're really not worshiping the one true living God. That the, that the one true living God has revealed himself through his only son, Jesus Christ. To not honor Jesus as the Son of God is to not honor God. 
So it's an incredible thing that he's laying out here for these people, which is what made them so angry. Mm -hmm. And which is why some, many of them, it said they, they believed on him. But then there were many who then began to plot behind the scenes to kill him because it was so radical. Oh, and desperately important. And these mighty truths that we're studying together. You know, when we think about people who are seekers after truth, I can think of a young man. As we close off, I remember about him. He was reading through the Gospel of John, trying to find out about religion and truth and reality and so forth. And he said later to me, as I got to John chapter 5, I realized this person is God in human form. This Jesus is God. I wonder what your answer is. I hope it's the right one. Thank you very, very much for joining with us today. And thank you both very much indeed. Love you.